Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, we'll focus more big picture on markets in terms of broad weakness that we are seeing this week and more, I guess, generally in the second quarter. We're only a couple weeks into the second quarter and the theme of rotation. We've chatted about the rotation of money quite a bit over the last three to four years. It seems like that money continuing to rotate into commodities. We're chatting with Mike Larson, editor-in-chief at Money Show. Mike, like I said, we've seen a bit of weakness starting off Q4, especially in terms of the broad averages. What's your takeaway from this? Is this a natural correction? Is this something more to be concerned about? Well, you know, I think this is kind of a continuation of that rotation that you're seeing out of the, the, the winners that we've had, right, for so long, the whole Mag7 technology-only type environment, to something that's broader, to something that's more focused on kind of almost has a little bit of a, a, a whiff of reflation in the air when you look at what's been doing well. Um, and I think that that's a little bit of what's going on, part of it. Of course, also is geopolitics. I mean, you know, when you've got missiles flying in, in the Middle East, and people concerned about what you know Israel might do in response to that and so on. That's got people, I, I think, just taking risk off the table after a fantastic Q1. I mean, you look at what happened in the first quarter. Again, the S&P had its best run since 2019. Best start of the year. You had you know multiple sectors and stocks that were up 10 percent plus uh, in a pretty short period of time. So I think that you know what you're seeing now in Q2 is is digestion, uh, digestion with a little bit of a sprinkling of rotation on top. And some of the more cyclically oriented and cycle type you know oriented people that or technically oriented excuse me people that I've spoken with that are in kind of our money show rotation and talked to in Miami last week it you know, really did say you know su- suggested April and May are probably going to be a little rough here you're going through this period where it's better to wait it out versus get real aggressive but in general the consensus seemed to be you know it's nothing more than that sort of digestion rotation consolidation versus one of those uh oh the, the primary trend is changing kind of environments Well, Mike, in addition to digestion and rotation and looking at things, you know, the consolidation of the markets, is it also a reality check that there's not going to be seven rate cuts this year and that there may only be one or two or maybe none, that we may have a zero rate cut environment this year? Is that weighing on the markets at all? Yeah, I think you're you're right on target there. I mean, obviously, Jay Powell spoke this week and, and kind of confirmed the messaging that was being heard about from other Fed speakers that, look, you know, we may want to cut. We may think it's probably the right thing to do, but, you know, we're not seeing enough that gives us the ability to do so at this point. So we're just going to keep sitting on our hands. So, you know, obviously, we've talked about it before. I mean, the market was looking for six, almost seven rate cuts. If you looked at the futures market pricing in at the start of the year, and that's basically depriced price to one or, like you said, possibly two, and the the start of that process has been pushed out further in 24. So, you, you know, you, you roll that all in together, and I don't think, again, I don't personally think it has to be anything catastrophic. I don't think it has to be anything too worrisome. Um, I think it it's good if you see money rotate out of those old leaders and start to find new homes in, in a broader participatory type environment. But, you know, anytime you see that, if everybody's got to get out of, you know, and laying up on some of all these big mega positions and mega cap tech, uh, that's going to take some steam out of the market. And that's what we're seeing. So since we're talking rates, then, Mike, how high can rates go in your eyes? We recently saw the two-year pretty much touch 5%. We saw the 10-year just recently up at 47 Is Are we close to the peak in rates then market-wise, or do you think they still could go higher? Look, I think a lot of it's going to have to depend on, you know, if we go from not just no rate cuts to whispers, you know, the H word again and hikes and so on. I just don't see that happening. I really don't think the Fed's going to going to switch from, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other. I was having a conversation earlier today here. And, you know, my point was, I think the hurdle for the Fed to start hiking again is much higher than the hurdle that uh, for them to start cutting a little bit. I mean, in other words, you know, it, it would take a, some really bad news on the inflation and other fronts, uh, to get them to, to not just deep, you know, not cut, but start hiking. Whereas it could take only slightly better news on the inflation front for them to start at least cutting once or twice, in my opinion. How much is the Japanese yen and what's going on in Japan, which with the, it's always been a carry trade, the yen, but the weak yen, how much is that causing them to sell U.S. treasuries? We've seen a number of articles about that. We've even had some friends of the show mention that what's going on in Japan is causing treasuries to be sold, which is what's driving the rates up. 
It's so hard to know that sort of boogeyman uh, trade, the yen carry trade. I mean, gosh, that's popped up. I mean, I've been in this business for a quarter century or so, and it's one of those things that just kind of pops up uh, from time to time. Not very often, but it's one of those, oh, okay, how much of this is going on and what does it mean for treasuries? What does it mean for risk, more broadly speaking, and so on? I don't think it's it's the big driver here. I think, again, it really just boils down to why would that be happening? Well, because their central bank is still being very unaggressive, whereas our central bank and other central banks have gotten very aggressive in the last few years. Uh, they've hardly play, played catch-up at all, so that you know, leads to big yield divergences and, and you know money falling from one currency to the other. I wouldn't freak out about it too much unless we really started to see this thing spiking. I think a lot more of what's going on is simply – Geopolitics sprinkled with, on top of that rotation, sprinkled on top of the fact that you have, you know, you have big tech that a lot of fund managers still have overweighted in, and they're now kind of eyeing the exits and looking to get out of that, or at least dial it back and look to get into to newer things. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why, on the flip side, if you're bullish commodities and you have been bullish metals and so on, you're loving this because this is what you know. I think we've talked about expecting for a while, uh, and, and you know, Gitto finally showed up, and that's that's what's happening in that part of the market. Yeah, it's almost right now like the perfect storm for some commodities, especially with the geopolitics. And also, look, central banks still looking to cut rates, but just pushing those back and further off later this year. What commodities are you focused on and even driving further down? What about the equities underlying those commodities? Which ones in your eyes have still the best upside ahead of them? Well, what happened on Friday is kind of interesting in gold. I think we might have hit a short-term exhaustion point where we had that you know, big rally on fears of what would happen the weekend, made a new intraday high, then kind of flopped into the close and pulled back a little bit, tried to bounce again. We're sort of just sitting around that 2,400-ish level for gold. In the, in the short term, that you know, that may just sign, signify a little bit of exhaustion there. So you know, from a trading standpoint, if, if you are, are, are on a short-term time frame, you might expect some chops and pullbacks and consolidation in gold. But longer term, I still think the precious metals, I still think gold has an extremely powerful bull case for it. I would be surprised if it, this run doesn't at least get us to the high twos over the next few months uh, in, in terms of gold pricing. Silver uh, silver and copper, I mean, are, are interesting. You're, you've seen, obviously, a pretty big breakout. Uh, silver finally playing catch-up, uh, as well as copper being very strong. And I think that speaks to, again, a decent you know, economic you know, news going from bad to decent, or at least, you know, not getting worse in places like China and so on overseas, the growth outlook here in the U.S. picking up as opposed to having you know, a harder landing and so on. So I think that economically sensitive type uh, parts of the metals market look good. And I was having a conversation with someone else and just highlighting, look, in copper too, you've got that sort of kicker of it being, you know, involved in this energy transition. This, uh, uh, you know, being a little bit sort of a stealth play on what's happening with renewables and energy transmission and so on, or transition. So that's kind of something that that benefits copper versus, say, some of the other base metals. So I think that's probably where you've got the. Or that's how I would would break it down. Copper, silver is still promising. You know, gold maybe consolidates a little here in the very short term, but you know, on a longer term basis, I think it's headed to the high twos. Mike, I appreciate you highlighting silver and copper because for a while, all we were hearing was that the only reason gold's going up is because of central bank buying. And that central bank buying was absolutely there underpinning it. But central banks don't buy copper. They don't buy silver. And they don't buy gold and silver or copper stocks. If you look at the copper stocks, man, those have really, the producers have really ripped higher. There's also now four copper ETFs where uh, a year ago there was only one. So there seems to be a lot of bigger money starting to position in what you've been dubbing the reflation trade. So maybe just speak to how this all ties into maybe not having this big recession, the most advertised recession that never came, but maybe a reflation. I, you know, you, you just said something. I'm, I'm going to steal that maybe, the most advertising recession that never came. I like I like that uh, slogan there. So good one with that. You know, again, it, it's you're seeing people, really, the data show that, look, the, you know, the economy, it cooled, but it didn't collapse. It may be turning up again, not just here, but overseas. Uh, you know, all all this stuff, this sort of doom and gloom. that, And, and to be honest, accurate when it comes to things like uh, Chinese real estate. And ghost cities and so on. A lot of that was a concern for the the, the base metals and, and other you know stuff type parts of the the commodities market. Um, I think that as you move some of that off the front pages and as you kind of dial back the the risk there, then that's going to bring in buyers and that's what we're seeing. So 
and again, it, and, and J.C. Parrott's brought up a great point, a conversation I had with him this week. Uh, it's that when you have commodities bull markets, historically, they don't tend to last a year or two. They tend to last a decade or two. It tends to be something that, you know, uh, long-term issues with supply and demand come home to roost, and uh, that doesn't just fix itself in six months or a year or whatever. So if that's the case, if this is sort of a new leg up, People throw around the word like commodity super cycle, and I'm not kind of that far uh, that far on the bullish camp. But I do think that there is some truth to the underlying thesis, which is that if you get this move going, it'd be hard to imagine it's just going to stop after you know 10% move or whatever it is, or 15%, depending on what kind of commodity you're talking about so far this year. So uh, I think that there you know there's definitely more room to run. What about some of these other commodity sectors, like the green narrative when it comes to energy? These ones uh, had a bit more attention back when other commodities weren't running. Now it's more the old school commodities that are continuing to move higher, while some of these newer school commodities or, I guess, green energy commodities are lagging. Do you see those playing into this at all? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if maybe you're referring to things like, you know, lithium prices, how they had that big pop and then drop. And now we're kind of just sort of stagnating there or some of those other type plays. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if you look at what's happened in the EV space, obviously, you know, th- there was huge demand for a while for EVs and, and a lot of activity done to sort of beef up the supply chains, gain access to some of the materials that go into that and so on. And now what's happening with interest rate tire on car loans and with people just saying, you know, worried about where range uh, ability to drive on, on some of these vehicles versus hybrids and so on. What do you, what do you see happening? You're seeing supply, you know, uh, dealer supply go up, uh, dealer demand go down, and that's working its way through the the kind of EV clean tech uh, food chain. But in general, again, I don't think that it's a well. We can just throw that out. It's all going to you know we're going to end up with a bunch of EVs parked at the at the junkyard. Uh, but it is something that that you know the demand supply situation got out of whack, and so that's probably going to weigh on the that those markets for a little bit. But you know, again, for every one example you could pick of that there, you could say, you could look at something like uranium, for example, which uh, is sort of in the alternative energy space that's doing very well. Demand supply pricing is still pretty firm, so um, you, you got kind of have to pick and choose your spots. But I think in general. The broad trend for commodities is up, and within that, there's parts of the market that are really, really enticing. Yeah, Mike, and with all the EVs, the, you know, there's all the electricity that's needed, the power grid upgrades and all the power generation. You can definitely lump copper in there. You could say silver is part of the solar movement, and definitely uranium's had a big move. But what about traditional energy, oil and nat gas? Nat gas can't get out of the slump it's in, but oil's had a pop recently and had a little pullback. But how much of that is geopolitical and how much of that is reflationary? Again, it, go, it speaks to just like with gold, like we were talking about what happened, you know, at the end of last week, gold had that big sort of tail end of the run that was obviously geopol- geopolitically driven and, you know, worries about what the heck's going to happen over the weekend and so on. You get past the weekend and it pulls back when the attacks didn't really spiral out of control. I think you're seeing something similar when it comes to oil, where, you know, you had a premium built into the oil market a little bit uh, on worries that something really bad might happen in the Middle East if it doesn't. I mean, if it's just sort of bad and not really, really bad, then that premium comes out. But same thing. I mean, you know, the the move that we've had in in oil, just like the move that we had in gold, I mean, these have been bull runs that have been going for, you know, several months now. Uh, Gold obviously being very strong more recently. And that was when the geopolitical situation was kind of on the back burner. So that right there tells you, hey, that's not, you know, there's cake here. (laughs) If the geopolitics are sort of the icing on the cake that give you those extra couple of bucks or whatever, uh, the cake itself is what's really driving the move underlying that. And, and, you know, I don't think even if you get, you know, of course, we all want peace. Even if you get a peace dividend or something breaking out, you lose a few bucks in oil, but then you find support based on the the bigger picture supply demand environment. Interesting, Mike. It it just seems like, look, a much better environment for commodities while a lot of other sectors had their run in the last couple of years. Now it's commodities turn as some of the other sectors fade away. A- anything else on your radar here that is outside of commodities, outside of anything that we've chatted about that you've noticed a bit of life perking up in? You kind of want to keep an eye on the crypto space there, too. I think uh, 
you know, I look at crypto versus gold. It's not necessarily a versus kind of situation. It's they sort of are benefiting from the same trend. People looking for alternatives outside of traditional assets, and so on and so forth. You know, I look at it as gold being more of the the tortoise and crypto being the hare. But the same, you know, they're running the same race towards the same finish line where they both end up higher. Uh, I think that you know it'll be interesting to see if that dynamic continues to play out. Uh, and I'd also say just you do have to watch the interest rate situation. If if there's something that I'm if I'm going to truly be proven wrong and I'm gonna, if, if something's really going to go go sideways on my my general bullish take, it's going to be if depricing Fed cuts turns into oh crap, the Fed's really going to have to turn things up and hike, hike, hike. That's going to you know I don't think that's going to happen. I don't expect that to happen. If that were to happen, then you know that's going to derail the, the the bullish thesis. But I don't you know again. I think this. I tend to agree with the people I've spoken with that that I trust and whose work I follow a lot. You know, when they speak at our events, when they speak in, in you know, just in person or whatever, um, that this is more just consolidation. It's what's to be expected after a big run. That, that you know, and the run, to be honest, wasn't just in the first quarter. It really started in November. So you had a couple extra months uh, for a lot of different stocks and, and so on where that had started running. So, I mean, it was a good five, six month move that now we're in the period of digestion from. Very good comments there, Mike. It's always great hearing kind of what sectors are on your radar all through those money shows as well, because you do have a lot of generalists that are following the trends and playing some of the swings as well. It means a lot hearing from you that you are hearing more uh, interest in the commodity sector, and we can see that by price action. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure chatting with you. We'll chat again in another couple weeks. You got it. Thanks so much, guys.